Hello, I'm Luca De Giglio, and this is the Web3 in Travel podcast, where you can learn about crypto, blockchain, and how the new internet will change travel. Hi, Sam. Welcome to the podcast. Tell us a bit of, a bit about you. Hi, Luca. Thanks for having me. Um, so, yeah, where do I start? I... Uh... My background's not in travel or Web3 at all. So I've kind of come from a long and storied uh, background across a number of different verticals, industries, various stages of business. But I'm based in Las Vegas, Nevada in the US. And most extensively, I worked in media. So I formerly ran a content production company called Poker Go, which as it sounds like, did streaming production, distribution of live poker tournaments and events. And so did that for several years, uh, left that business in 2020. And then for a couple of years, bounced around doing random odds and ends, uh, a lot of investing in startups, consulting for early stage companies, and just kind of, you know, trying to figure out my next move. And this all kind of came to a head for me in like Web3 and travel side of it. So on one hand, given the Web3 side, uh, we can we can joke amongst a group like this about the uh, Web3 being a little bit degen sometimes. So my background being in poker, a little bit, uh, yeah, a little bit, well, uh, it, yeah. it, it's it, it paralleled nicely. Exactly. It's like <laughs> exactly so so a lot of poker players like they index incredibly high for crypto adoption so i was i was seeing not only seeing crypto firsthand but seeing real use case for it in cross-border transactions if you think about like the poker yeah. tournament calendar you one week you're playing an event in the u.s the next week you're playing an event in london next week you're playing an event in korea so given a poker player's bankroll needing to transfer assets from jurisdiction to jurisdiction to be able to buy into the tournaments, which is their livelihood, the most effective and effective and efficient way to do that became through Bitcoin transfers and being, and then being able to exchange cash on site with various people. So I was just watching this play out in first hand, however, not doing much with it. It was, I was kind of passively investing on the side, which at the time wasn't investing enough in hindsight, but it's always 2020 in that sense. And uh, so I was exposed to it very early on. However, again, didn't do much with it. Uh, worked in media, like I said, that all, it all came to a head in the 2021 era of NFTs. So as you'll remember, the big NFT boom, all of a sudden you're, you're hearing stories of these very expensive JPEGs trading hands. And I thought it was silly at first. And until I slowly started getting involved in perhaps irresponsible type of ways, investing in what turned out to be very crappy JPEGs for large sums of money, but what I found to be fascinating, which harkened back to my media background with Poker Go, where my job was really to super serve a passion base and to create digital fandom out of this passion sport, passion hobby of poker playing, where my metrics, my success was determined by the anonymity of TV ratings with uh, streaming numbers, where I, I, I saw results, but I had no way of getting to know my audience to make my future performance better, where NFTs as a way to create that digital affinity around a shared passion or sort of this aha moment for me of like this, it's a meme to say NFT solved this, but it very clearly was for me, NFT solved that. So that all kind of came together in a, in a really interesting type of way where I was, I was already familiar with the technology, but then became a believer, believer in this specific use case in NFTs very quickly and basically dropped everything I was doing to get into the space full time and some combination of consulting, advisory and investing. And then my first thesis became, okay, what is what is that passion area that I think could be made better by NFT collecting? And that was the original the original thesis for getting into this travel world where I've, I'm an avid traveler myself. Uh, you know, the, the one time that we met in person was in Barcelona, despite neither of us being based there. Like, you know, we're, we're kind of a part of the circle now. And I gravitated towards this vertical as a way, you know, how can we extend the value of travel beyond the bookends of a trip itself? And so... That's what led me down this road of Web3 travel, of exploring different business models and opportunities in the space. And it's been a fun road. And I'm just super happy to be here. Cool. Uh, it's, fu it's fun how speculation in crypto has is, is almost like the marketing of crypto. It's like true speculation, through the promise of you know easy money. Uh, many people come in and then a few stay after the inevitable crash yeah. which always happens 
but a few stay because they, as you, they understand there's something more than that, right? Speculation is all the fog, but there's something behind, and it's it's very nice to see how this is, keeps playing out, and, and th that, that's why bull runs exist. Uh, it's to make some noise and get some people to stay after that, and there's always more people staying yeah. after that. So yeah, nice. So how was it's, your? It's, it's, yeah. Yeah, Sorry, there's an interesting parallel that you, you maybe think about if thinking about like it, it means it startups in general, but no truer, truer taste than in Web3 startups. Just like the best thing, the only job you have in a, like a Web3 startup is like staying alive and like market yeah. cycles can obviously they, they call a lot of, uh, you know, the let's let's just call a spade a spade, like the inferior projects and staying power is very important in the space. And I personally feel like that's a use case led. And that's where, that's where Web3 travel is so exciting to me of like looking at the practical ways that Web3 makes travel experiences better and travel infrastructure better. And that's what staying power looks like to me. So yes, it's about like the bull cycles of getting attention and to your point being that marketing mechanism, but then you have to, you have to then be prepared to, to, to survive the bear cycles as well. And once you, once you can detach the value of what you're doing and putting forward independent of the speculation that often brings people into the space, that's when you have something special. And that's what we need to get towards in order to like actually see adoption in this space. Um, do you think we are in a bull market right now? I think we're approaching one. I'm not, I'm not prepared to say that we're in one, <laughs> but I think, I think we're yeah. seeing a momentum shift. Okay, cool. Well, we had a couple of, of quiet years, so I guess it's time. So um Mint Pass, right? This is the, the project you have uh you have recently launched. Um tell us about it. Yeah, sure. So it's it's uh, much like my background being along and winding road, just the origination of Mint Pass has, has been pretty much that as well. So I mentioned in 2021 wanting to get in this world of web three travel and trying to make this sense of community, sense of proof of experience, sense of collectorship and the psychology that surrounds it, make that work in the travel space. And that's led us to what Mint Pass is today. And we're, so we, we're, we've announced it and we're going to be launching our MVP next month. But essentially what it is, is all tied to travel sharing. And we're trying to create this digital experience out of the known psychology and behavior of souvenir collecting. So if you think about, and this is this is evidenced from a lot of our conversations with users and people who love to travel time and time again, where we see this consistent behavior of people creating physical artifacts of their travel experiences through a souvenir collection, which in essence is trivial, but in, in actuality, it's not in terms of what it means and how it translates to digital realms, where you have this phenomenon where you, you want to collect a token, a physical token of an experience you had, and you put that next to other tokens from other experience to create this picture of picture of experience as a matter of identity, where there's this interesting phenomenon where one of those assets, let's call them in a vacuum, means nothing. So let's use an example of like mugs on a shelf, like an individual mug that has like Paris on it doesn't really say anything other than being able to pour coffee in it and drink it in the morning. But when you put that mug next to the, the mug from Australia, next to the mug from Rome, and all these things together, you paint this picture of experiences that is very special and means something to someone. And, the, and typically that's the person who's collected these things over the years. However, inherently, the process of that is restricted by you know, physical parameters, the scalability of sharing, the fact that it's tucked away in a cabinet for, for most of the time. Uh, and basically, we, we don't see the ability to make what is a critical part of people's identity and their past travel experiences, take that to digital mediums where we spend most of our time to create experiences around that. So that's where the original idea began is like, how do we, how do we create a, a digital souvenir collectorship experience that not only allows you to better showcase your travel experiences digitally and on chain, but then creating value surrounding that in various ways that traces back to your travel experiences. So basically you can get value leading up to your travels, obviously during your travels, but then after your travels as well. And we've, we've, we've come a long way from that original concept over the past year and a half, but essentially that's become this experience of a geo, geolocation authentication of travel. So when you go somewhere via your mobile device, we know that you're there. And then we, we see at your activities while you're abroad, such that over time you collect these 
digital souvenirs that showcase not only where you've been, but what you've done to create this larger holistic narrative of past travel experiences. And there's, there's gamified mechanisms around that. Think like a, think like Pokemon Go collectorship, or I should say yeah. Pokemon Go a gamified collectorship mixed with like Foursquare travel logging. So you travel around the world, you collect NFTs tied to the things that you do, which holistically become a picture of all these things that you've done for you to commemorate, celebrate, share with others, connect with like-minded travelers and so on and so forth. But then that's where like the really interesting Web3 mechanics come into play that we're still exploring and going to be experimenting with early on, where we've identified, and one of the interesting common denominators we found time and time again with those same travelers I mentioned before, is around like recommendation sharing. So for, for people who travel as much as we do, I'm not sure if you do this yourself, but I found a lot of people like us who do, using the likes of like Apple Notes, Google Sheets, mm -hmm. Uh, calendar apps, camera rolls to document what you do when you travel. Yes, for the purposes of per for personal commemoration, but also for sharing that with others in the future. So when I have a friend who's going to London, they may hit me up and say, hey, I'm taking a trip to London. Do you have any recommendations? I can do a quick copy and paste of my list to them. Now, there's nothing necessarily wrong with that. And intrinsically, there's a ton of value existing. But in a, in a Web3 type of way, despite the number of people that I've sent to these various hotels and restaurants and things abroad that based upon my lived experience, I get no value out of having done that as like a, you know, a incentive alignment type of way. So how do we introduce like web three incentive mechanics to word of mouth recommendations? So basically the NFT collecting side is the lived experience authentication, which as a baseline creates more authentic verified reviews ecosystem in a sense. But then further, how do I then create rewards for inspiring others to have those same experiences where you create this like, like it's, I hate to like compare ourselves to that, but think of like the friend tech e economics of like, okay. you know, keys and access to uh, mm. certain people's content, I suppose, but right. then do that in a world of travel. So like we create an incentive structure where those who have the most depth of experience are rewarded and further they are further rewarded for then inspiring others to be able to unlock experiences for them, all powered by the authenticated experiences of the baseline, if that makes sense. And I don't want to so, get too far well, in the weeds because, like I said, it's yeah, still no, because everything. I don't think everybody knows what friend tech is. So let's explain it. It's basically a social social media where when I get in, I have to buy a profile. And that gives me access, let's say I buy your profile for a certain amount of money, and that gives me access to a room where, like an online room where I can talk to you. And every time somebody buys your link or your profile, the price goes up on a bounding curve. So there's also this speculative aspect, which brings a lot of people in because then people start seeing the price going up. So they start to buy. And, and so when I buy a link, I, I'm getting two things. I'm getting an investment on your persona, betting that you are, uh, basically you're gonna have more followers in a way. And also I get mm -hmm. access to you. And there's a new one which came out a few days ago. Have you heard about it? Um, very similar. I saw it. Remind me of the name. Uh, give me a second because I go here. Coordinate, Colinks, Colinks. Very oh, similar I didn't, I didn't to. That one. Yeah, very similar concept to friend tech, but with a less speculative curve. Like when, so, when yeah. somebody buys a link, it doesn't go up in price so fast. Because what happened with friend tech, the prices went really high. So if I had to buy a profile of, I don't know, Kobe, it was a few ETH, so $10,000 or something, and it's too much. This one is, is growing a bit slower, but... So are you you're planning something like this in, in Minpass or is just an inspiration? Yeah, I wanted to put an asterisk on it because like the, the speculative elements that you described there are factually correct, but for our purposes, that's not the elements that interest us. It's more about creating an on-chain social architecture around depth of experience and quality of recommendations. So what we found in just like the, the travel inspiration landscape, particularly in the way of like travel influencers, not to say there's anything wrong with finding you know, the finding ho travel inspiration, hotel selections from an influencer, but there's misaligned incentives because a lot of times travel influencers aren't in it to enable the best experiences for their audiences, but rather they're in it to get brand deals. They're in it to get sponsorships. Uh, and, and for that matter, the, a lot of times the reason for them having a lot of followers, not to be kind of cynical on my part, 
is not because of necessarily they're like super well traveled, but because they're really good at filtering their pictures. Perhaps they're in really good shape and people like looking at them on beaches across the world. What interests me most as someone who travels a lot is A, people I know and trust, B, having those people who are like me in some sense, C, certain verification. So like I would, I'd much, I, this is, we all agree that a recommendation from a friend who, you know, has been there is worth 10 times more than like 10 random reviews on TripAdvisor or something oh, where I, w- I want recommendations from people I know, I trust, and I'm willing to forego any other resource yeah. to get those recommendations. So how do we, how do we recognize that in an ecosystem like this? And that's where I harken back to like the friend tech examples around like creating a, a point system in a sense that's tied to your past verified experiences, as well as the quality of recommendations as calculated by the inspiration that you've inspired for others. And then how do we create an ecosystem that rewards, acknowledges and elevates that? So it's not about necessarily, this person has a, has a ton of followers and they're in really good shape and takes a lot of bikini pictures. You should definitely be following them and listen to their travel advice. I wanna know who's, who's taken a hundred flights this year, who's been to New York 50 times, Who's right. been to, when they've, on those 50 trips to New York, they've been to the same Italian place 40 times. They've recommended that to a hundred people. They've all loved it. Like, okay, yeah, I'm, I'm in, I'm going to that Italian place for sure. And then be creating that incentive structure that rewards that behavior. Um, t- take me through the, 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 the customer or the, the user uh, journey. So let's say I'm, I'm a user of mid bus. I travel a lot. I want to, uh, I want to basically um, get an NFT in every place I go, right? That's a big mm-hmm. idea. So what is my first step? Do I buy a, a central NFT? Do I mean something? Or I just start with my first NFT in, in London? No, so yeah, it, it's free to use. So okay. essentially, essentially, you know, you, you have one of the, 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 the critical things for us is sharing location data. So you have to keep that on at all times or just put it on when you travel for the purposes of utilizing the app. But okay. essentially, two, either one of two things will happen. One, we'll see that you've moved over 50 miles within a short span of time that captures like road trips, train rides and so on to say like, hey, it looks like you're traveling. Where are you headed? So you're taking a trip to Miami. I say I'm going to Miami. We say, okay, cool. Once you get there, we're going to start your logging experience behind the scenes. Like nothing, there's nothing active to be done. The other okay. trigger being when we see you go to an airport, we have some you know confidence you're probably taking a flight. Same experience there. Hey, it looks like you're about to hop on a flight. Let us know where you're headed. And then once you get there, we start tracking your location, your activities while you're abroad. So you get you you land at the airport, you then head to your hotel, you're there to check in for an hour or two, get settled, clean up. You then head out to a restaurant to have lunch, you're there for an hour, you then go to a museum, you're walking around for two hours, you then go back to the hotel to clean up, you see where this is going. At the end of the day, or at the end of the trip, regardless of like, you could basically check in with it whenever you want to, we then give you a digest of all the things that we showed that you have done based upon, you know, where you were, how long you were there, what time of day it was, basically, we use like back end logic to project what your activities were based upon all these different variables. You tell us, you know, A, what's correct, because inherently there's geolocation wise, there'll be some adjustments to be made. So like, what, where were you actually, what were you doing? Or, or similarly, like if you were having lunch at a hotel, not staying there, you'll want to define, okay, I was having, I was here for a meal, okay. not for a hotel stay. Um, and then you, you decide what you want to share being like nest within the NFT as a matter of like chronicling your experience. And then, over time that out of the you and i should say too you provide um whatever like text or image-based ugc you want so if you had a meal and you want to add pictures to it to like provide sort of visual aids around the experience again for your own commemoration as well as for surfacing to others as recommendations in the future you add that and then you essentially lock that and then that will the, the trip itself uh we're using a 6551 the trip itself is like the tr- master NFT. And then each of your experiences is a nested NFT within that. So you're basically, as you're, every activity you do, every activity you log is in an NFT in and, in and of itself. And you collect these things as you travel. Um, hopefully, hopefully that makes sense. So at the conclusion is, of the trip, that, um, it, that, yeah, that, so that, let me maybe try to explain how I understood it. Uh, I go to London, I turn on my phone, I turn on the, basically the app. I leave it on as long as possible. First of all, can I turn it off sometimes or is it going to break some something or whatever? 
Uh, if, if I mean, your, your, your device, by my knowledge, unless there's a technical way around it, which I'm the non-technical founder of a bunch, so I couldn't give you a definitive no, answer. But I mean, but my... if I don't use the app for a while, does it, I mean, is it going to completely break my NFT thing or I can, it's still okay. Like, I don't want you to, mm -hmm. I don't want you to know that I've been to that restaurant, for instance, like. No, no, you, can, you, you know. can turn it off. You, you can okay. turn it off. Okay. You could, I mean, so, you just, we, we, would, we would pick up where you left off once you well, turn there, it off. Well, there Okay. So then uh, that creates an NFT, uh, which contains all the other parts of the travel. So I've got the London NFT with all the restaurants and the metro and, uh, and the shops, et cetera, right? Is this an ER6551? Is like the NFT in the NFT Okay, Correct. fantastic. Like so the back, the cool. backpack. So, 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 so the, the trip backpack. is like the backpack, and then you're you're cool. piling in your your experiences okay. into that's... that backpack. Where at the end, it becomes like an out of the box record of experience for the trip holistically together. Yeah, let, let me explain this because this is pretty new, and many people won't know about that. So, there's a new, uh, let's say, a new standard called ERC sixty five fifty one, which allows an NFT to own other NFTs and to own tokens. So. I can I can have an NFT, a backpack with, with inside other NFTs and even even tokens, so money. And this is one of the first, uh, maybe this is the first I've heard applied in travel, uh, other than theories and ideas. So this is uh, very very interesting. So and after that, so in these NFTs, do I also add my recommendations in some way? So that's where like the after the fact comes into play. So I, okay, I, the last thing the I'll say on like the trip logging experience, which is kind of like more of a fun thing than anything like revolutionary, but we thinking about this as a, as a souvenir, we want there to be like a cool visualization of your experience on the whole. And we're inspired in like a weird sort of, uh, it's because it's counter to everything like super tech forward and web three, but we're inspired by like postcards and like the traditional sense of like, Here's yeah. here's this trip that I had. I'm going to send that to a friend and let them see this place that I'm in. But all postcards that you would see in a rack in an airport look the exact same. We want to create this cool dynamic where as you log your activities, your visualization of your experience changes to be custom to what you're doing. So like on a daily basis, if I log, uh, you know, if I'm in Paris, I go to the Louvre, I go to the Eiffel Tower. At the conclusion of that day, like we use AI artwork to basically change the representation of your experience on the front end to then have the Louvre and the Eiffel Tower or some references to it embedded in the artwork of the front of your souvenir. And then the next day, you then go to this cafe and then you go out to the countryside and then you start to visualize that as a part okay. of it. So it's this cool sort of like cause and effect of what I'm doing having an effect on the output of what I'm creating. But then moreover, that being one of one and unique to me, unlike anything else you'd see in the traditional souvenir world. So that's kind of a cool throw in as well. Uh, but then the output of that, obviously, you then have this out of the box digital souvenir, which uh, as, at face value is just like, hey, here's this cool thing I did. But within that is, here's not only this cool thing I did, but then all the things that I did, uh, experienced, whatever. That gets populated in a personalized dashboard interface, much like a, almost like a social profile in a sense of, you know, here, here I am. Here is the, here's a visualization of all my experience. Think of like a pinned map on the wall like you have behind you there. The metadata within those NFTs populates in a map type interface. I'll have a news feed of all the trips that I've taken. The visualization that I described earlier of each of these experiences then populates in that, in that news feed of sorts where not only from my end, I could see like a chronological list of trips that I've taken, but I can follow the trips of my friends and see like, oh, you know, so-and-so just took a trip here. So-and-so just took a trip there. I could click on that trip, explore their experiences within that, how many trip legs they took. Can I see like, you know, the routes on a map, all the other cool things. But then in the future, like that's, the, as the data builds over time, it becomes more powerful where not only for the purpose of getting to see and visualize my travel experiences, but then also if I'm needing to tap into my network for recommendations, I say, I'm taking a trip to Rome. And I am looking for a place to stay. I'm looking for reservations to get. And the normal flow would be, okay, well, I go to review sites and going to top 10 trip advisor lists. I'm searching blogs, uh, destination guidebooks, looking at TikTok and, and Instagram influencers, putting up an Instagram story, asking my friends for recommendations. How do I create this, that one-stop shop for the, the recommendations I care about most, which is word of mouth from friends based upon their lived experience. And this becomes that. So essentially I can go to like a Rome interface. As I search Rome, I can see who of my friends has been to Rome based upon their mid-past okay, collectorship. Mm -hmm. I can see how many times they've been there. 
I can see what they did when they were there and what they recommend as such. And I can make that actionable to me with one click booking at that point of inspiration. So we're going to work with third party partners to say, if I see this phenomenal hotel in Rome that my friends stayed at, I know that I want to stay there. I click on that. I book that for myself. And then that's where we kind of have the reward structures take place where we create, we, do we, we have affiliate powered incentives on the back end to allow us to create a reward structure tied to inspiring others to book their travels based upon others' recommendations. So rewards will be affiliate, uh, let's say, you know, booking.com affiliation, right? Something like that. Yeah, that's, and that's, that, that's, it's very, it's, that's the, that's the ever evolving conversation for us is. Okay. How do we how do we make those rewards sustainable? And that's where we kind of have to take the square peg of Web two and fit it into the round hole of Web three. Well, yeah. where like sometimes in some ways the, the the existing models of travel don't exactly work with the in, more innovative models of Web three, and that's and that's what we're doing here, right? Is trying to make that all work together. So that's it's that's that's what the exploration process for us is like figuring out how to bring those two things together and why we're taking a very gradual approach to launching because i mean you talked you met you cited friend tech earlier and i think we've seen the boom and in some ways the bust that was wasn't is friend tech because of you know they rolled out this innovative incentive structure that didn't have sustainability to it where we don't want to do that like we want to we basically want to build the, the user behavior first of like log your travels share it with friends as recommendations as a baseline and then plugging in the back end of rewards into that over time in a more sustainable way and we we see it web3 incentives being a key part of that that's what we ultimately strive to do but is there so your friends okay but can you also check what other people do like do you all, so yeah yeah and and that's i alluded to it earlier in regards to like the creating the social network and social architecture i don't that's, i don't use the phrase social networks we don't see ourselves as being like a, a instagram competition or anything like we want to be a complement to instagram where for travel creators let's say Instagram is the window shopping of experiences, but I want to deep dive into exactly what you've done. I go to I go to your Mint Pass profile, but we want to create the social architecture around acknowledging, elevating, and celebrating people with great experiences. So that's okay. where that's what you're referring to is like I could I could like you know get input from my friends, but then if I want to find you know well traveled people who are like me within the network that I may not know, but I could trust the recommendations because we yeah. have similar past experiences. Yeah, yeah, That's yeah. where that piece will come into play. And we have like the metrics okay. tied to, okay, I know, I know this person has validated their experience it's enough to know they have this traveler score, let's call it. And thus I can trust what they say that I should do when I make this trip to somewhere that they've been. It, uh, it does, it does make sense because l let's say that you want to go like, uh, you want to go to Rome and you want to find a nice, something happened to me, a nice ice cream, so a gelato shop, right? And the best gelato shops, like the ones with the most reviews and the highest reviews were very, very central in very touristic areas. And the, the ice cream was really horrible and very expensive. Why? Mm -hmm. well, because it's, it's been it's been rated by people who maybe I don't have a lot of experience with ice cream, right? While the best ice cream shops, they are not well known and only locals know, et cetera. So what is the issue with this uh, today's reviews is that, first of all, you don't know how many of them are real, first of all, mm -hmm. especially TripAdvisor is a disaster, but even Google Maps, you know, we're really sure. And secondly, who is leaving, who, that's the question, who is leaving the review? I mean, if somebody has been to New York once for three days on a honeymoon, they're going to tell you something about New York and somebody has been like, a hundred times for many reasons, the, the the weight of the words is so different, right? And with Google Maps or Chip Advisor, you don't know who is. I think we're all the same. So one review yep. is worth the same. It doesn't matter who's who's leaving this review. So they're kind of worthless in a way. It's a bit like Amazon. That's another thing. But like one thing I don't like about Amazon reviews is that people get the package at home. They open the package. They're very happy. It looks good. Perfect. You, you haven't even touched the thing and maybe it's broken in three yeah. days, right? So yeah, yeah, the reviews are broken. That's true. And that's certainly uh, an attempt to fix them by giving the credibility of the reviewer, by, by play, basing it on the credibility of the reviewer, right? Is that a, a good 100%. way to... Okay. okay. Yeah. I want to yeah, know, I want to know who that said that. Also another thing, like you, you go to... Italy, right? I'm Italian. So I, you go to Italy, I want to know where to have a good pizza. 
and all the reviews are, are written by people from many other countries. And I would like, no, that, that happened to me in Greece, actually. I wanted to know the best restaurant in Thessaloniki according to locals, not according to tourists yeah. like me, right? There's yeah. no way to do that. So how do you how do you filter this? There's no way. It's completely broken, yeah. right? So you end up again after, you know, 30 years of the internet, you're still looking for places on the street and looking at how they look, right? Trying to kind of read the place. So you're completely broken. Yeah. This could fix it. This could certainly because you you don't only don't only give the location like where, where the person is from, but the whole travel, well not the whole travel history they have, but like a certain amount of travel history they have. So I, I definitely see the value in this, that's what I'm trying to say. Yeah, no, I, uh, I, I, I'm so glad to hear you say that because it's a problem that I've had many times over the years in my own travels. And I think you mentioned it in regards to, you know, the tourists coming to town and leaving these reviews, which, I mean, you, you said yourself, TripAdvisor is kind of a play to play to pay to play type scheme. And then for that matter, they're incentivized to push reviews. Like maybe it's maybe in the in the ice cream example, it's like get a free scoop of ice cream if you leave us a five star review on TripAdvisor. It's like, OK, right. well. I'm for sure going to leave a five-star TripAdvisor review, which, as it turns out, it's not because it's good ice cream, but because people wanted free ice cream. So just the incentives, the incentives are misaligned in that sense. But then, further to your point, like I don't, I don't really care about the most pleased or the most devastated, angry of customers who are the ones who are incentivized to leave reviews to either get a reward, feel better about themselves, to get on a soapbox, to to try to punish the restaurant, whatever the reason my people may leave reviews, I want to know like what are the authentic experiences. And I think too, particularly like cross border, we talk about US to Europe, the number of times for as an American going to Europe and seeing seeing places that have like three, three and a half star reviews, with a lot of the reviews being like, I wasn't given service fast enough, or I, I had to ask to put in my put in my order, or they didn't take our drink order until 20 minutes in. Like basically Americans coming out of the American standards into European cultures, expecting American service where they're, they're right. not going to get that. And then taking it out in the reviews where at the same time, the restaurant could give two shits and they're not going to like, they're not going to micromanage their reviews. They're just there to be a good restaurant and create good food for their customers. And those who, those who want to be there will get it. But those that, you know, are misaligned in their expectations will then end up punishing them or trying to on social channels. All that being said, the best experience I've had are places like that. And those have all been powered by word of mouth recommendations where I've got a great buddy who will tell me to go somewhere. I may like cross reference it with TripAdvisor and it's like, oh, it's like three, three and a half stars. Like, I hope it's good, but like, I trust my friend. So let's go for it. And then it's phenomenal. And it, like I said, it'll be a lot of like just the whining and complaining that would, would normally skew me away from having this great experience, but that's trumped by the word of mouth recommendation from a friend who I trust. And then last point, particularly around like the repetition of experiences to create weighted, weightedness to recommendations. Cause to your very point, I've had that same thing where, you know, I, I travel to New York quite often for work, at least a couple of times a year. I've probably been there like 20 times overall. It's not a ton, but like a decent amount. There's like a restaurant that I love. And like, if anyone goes to New York, I'm like, you have to go to this place. And I've probably been there 15 out of 20 trips. So like, imagine seeing that on my profile. I've been to New York 20 times. I've been to the same Italian restaurant 15 times. I have this other friend who went to New York once who went to one Italian restaurant that he said was good just because it was at a, because just because it was like down the street from his hotel. It was like the first place he saw and walked into. Like, we'd all agree, like you probably want to go to the, the, the former of the two to the one where you not only have been there, but then went back a dozen times over versus the one random run in with a random Italian place uh, in the middle of Manhattan. So it's like creating, again, how do we, and that's part of our product challenge, right? Is like, how do we create that architecture to weigh, weigh the, not only the, not just the reviews, because we're not, we don't want to call ourselves a review site either. We're a recommendation site. Excuse the fireworks. I think, this is a new, I think it's, you it's move a, something. <laughs> it's it's a new, move. it's a new Apple feature that always seems to get me tripped up. Sorry about right. that. What um, is it when you do that? that what, what, what cause it's, that? Uh, it's, it's, it's two thumbs up. Oh, right. Okay. Okay. So it's like very, very good news that I'm delivering, which I guess this could be. Um, but yeah, no, it's how do we, how do we create, how do we create the interface to allow you to glean out the most powerful and most impactful of reviews that are again, powered by that lived experience. It's not about like the one-off time that you had a crappy meal and you want to take it out on the restaurant. It's just about like going out and, and living and having fun and enjoying travel and then being able to unlock that for others while rewarding you for doing so.
Yeah. Plus, you know, for instance, I know about you that you've been to Italy a few times. So when you're recommending a, an Italian restaurant in New York, your words are uh, carry more weight than somebody who maybe has never yep. been because you, you have you can compare, right? Then maybe you are maybe the, the kind of food you like is what I don't like, but and then I figure it out later. But you know, it, there's no perfect system here, but certainly we have very good signal because I know who you are, even if I don't know you personally, I can see what you've done, where you've been, right? So mm -hmm. yeah, I certainly see this. You have um well yeah, go ahead yeah. I was, I was going to say another sort of wrinkle in this I think is fun to think about is the counter to this, which is like people that have crappy recommendations. So let's say mm -hmm. regardless of their lived, ex like they could have a ton of experiences, but like they're just, they just maybe don't have good taste and that's okay. People, some yeah. people just don't. Happens, yeah. And so thinking about like the, the trickle down ramifications of those who take other people's reviews and don't have positive experiences. So let's say, you know, you, you list your recommendations and then other people take you up on those, but then they, you know, they rate things thumbs down as after having taken your recommendations. And we're not going to punish you for that. Like your opinions are opinions and people may differ from you, but we might need to weigh them downward in our ecosystem, just knowing that like, they're not necessarily a taste maker that we want to point people towards. So again, it, it's, you, it, there's really, that's, that's why I needed to cite Fred tech that there's a lot wrong with Fred tech, but I think there's interesting mechanics around, like it make mixing incentives with social equity tied to travel recommendations and in, in particular doing so for the purposes of enabling experiences for other people. And does this extend to accommodations too? So reviews like on Airbnbs or hotels, those are, are broken in an even worse way because you have the incentive of the platforms to have good reviews no matter what, because if the same hotel has, uh, very good reviews on booking and very bad reviews on Airbnb. Booking is going to get more bookings because people book places. Not, mm -hmm. not, 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 not necessarily comparing them because. But if they see good reviews, they're going to book. If they see bad reviews, they're not going to book. So these platforms incentivize good reviews no matter what. And they, I wrote recently on LinkedIn, where they basically changed how my, uh, the meaning of numbers. Like when I went to school, we had in Italy a zero to ten note system, like. Seven was great. Six was okay. Eight was very good, right? Yeah. Now, a hotel on booking with seven, it's it's basically hell. You, I mean, you don't go in a seven hotel with seven yeah. out of ten. So, or Airbnb, a four point, I mean, the minimum, if you want to have like, have a good probability to have a good experience is 4.8, I would say. Now, of course, it's subjective, but yeah. You don't go to a 4.5 or 4.4. You know something is wrong there, right? So they, they skew the meaning of numbers. Uh, again, because I, we don't know if if at least I knew who left the review, right? What kind of person does this? And so, yeah, again, if this extends to accommodations, even better because that's that's also needed. But you have some uh, you have some competition in in the Web three world, which is like one is trend, right? Trend is a uh, uh, also more than you actually base reviews, uh, reviews based, I, I guess. Mm. Um, and then you have also legends. Uh, they have a similar thing. Legend, they like they have your app where you have an NFT which represents uh, basically your travel persona. Uh, not so much focused on reviews, but I mean, yeah. I would say uh, that certainly validates the need for a solution because it means that the review system is not now basically working. Um, yeah. What do you think about that? So, so to your po earlier point, I, it's actually, uh. and then we see this, well, like even outside of just like hotels and travel where it's become like the, like the food health grading system here in the U S where like everyone has to have an A and if you have a B then there's something gravely wrong with you and no one's going to go in and it's like a death sentence to your entire establishment. Right. We see it with uh, like Uber drivers come to mind too, where you, you get a, you get a driver in, you, you see them, I have like 4.8 stars. And it's like, what's what's wrong with them? Like, am I going to die again. on Why this right to the perfect. airport? <laughs> yeah, exactly. And 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 it, and, it, and it goes the other way too, where like I could, it could be like crazy taxi out there. I could be like almost getting into a car accident, uh, driver cursing, just going full-blown insanity. And I'm like, that was a horrible ride, four stars. You always feel guilty for, for, for yeah. wanting to leave anything less than four right. stars. And so we've entirely lost the meaning of like what it yeah. means to, 
give authentic reviews because there's too many, let's call it feelings, dynamics, just, we don't, we just, we've lost the forest through the trees in a sense. Um, all that being and said. Sorry to interrupt you. And then we don't get punished for this. So if you leave four out of five to a crazy driver, you're not paying any, you're not getting punished, but you are incentivizing people to book the same crazy driver. And it seems to me that your exactly. system solves that because this time you are yeah. reviewing for your friends. Yep. Yep. And I, and I think what I want to, want to be clear about in regards to our product versus others that you reference in the space there, we're not a review site and we may, and that's like a trend as an example, we may partner with them to source in their reviews and source in their data to provide more context about a given experience. But what we don't want is to set up an experience where like, let's say I'm going through my itinerary of days events after, you know, a, a day out in Rome and I'm having to like, okay, this meal, three stars, four stars, four and a half stars. And here's the reason why. Okay. Go to this museum. Uh, that was a great museum, five stars. And here's why, like we we're going to be very sort of, did you have a good time or not? I, th the best comp that I have for it is like rotten tomatoes. Like when you're going through, mm -hmm. give thumbs up or thumbs down, which for you purposes is like thumbs up. It means you recommend it thumbs down. You don't. And that's as simple as that. But then in aggregate, we have all this data to say, okay, well, 90% of people gave this an experience a thumbs up, which which again, going back to like Rotten Tomatoes for movie reviews, for those that are familiar, people just, people say good movie or bad movie, but then in aggregate, that becomes a, a picture of quality of movie. If it's like 90% say that's a good movie and 10% don't, as opposed to 20% say it's a good movie and, and so on and so forth. So we're, we're less concerned about like the review side. And for that matter, we'll probably funnel in data from other sources for those that do inherently need to like deep dive a given experience. But Really, we want to. We just want to be an experience validator and and do quick hitting affinity analysis of just like did you like it or not, which ultimately is is what matters when it comes to a recommendation. Okay, what goes on chain uh, of all these data and all these transactions? What goes on chain and what doesn't go on chain? It's a good and timely question for us. So we're kind of figuring out those elements in the back end. So obviously, like location data essentially and i think and so there's a nice there's a nice story here and this is this is i'm going to give you answers to answer the question at all but then i'll segue that into how i answer the question with how i answer the question but i think like travel as as identity and, and in particular in this case on-chain identity and on-chain legacy really is a really special thing and we've seen this time and time again especially like with older subsets of our potential audience in terms of how they think about their life story and as a matter of, and a function of the places that they've been and the inadequate way that we tell that story. And you think in the digital era, sure, you know, you, we all post on Instagram and we travel, we share things across social, we share them with friends and family, but think about like how much of our travel memories live in centralized repositories, whether it be an Instagram feed, whether it be DMs, stories, let's say you're deplatformed, the platforms just inherently cease to exist someday those memories are gone with it. So how do we how do we preserve travel as a matter of legacy with longevity and permanence, with immutability, all these things that blockchain technology and, and Web3 at large promises? And so that's it's it's those critical factors that we want to capture on chain. So like location, the time, um, and there's, there's there's a sliding scale of all of this. Like I'm not anything I say here is not is not binding. That this is an ongoing question for us, and that's one of our early questions to figure out post MVP is like what needs to be on chain as opposed to wanting because like for example one of the things we talked about is like for the ugc that we place in conjunction with these nfts like it's a lot obviously to put images on chain but then for that matter your perception of experiences change over time the example that i was talking to my co-founder about is like if i if i took a bunch of trips with like i'm i'm married now but if i if i take a bunch of trips with a uh, girlfriend at some point in time and then we break up like i don't want these pictures and i don't want Forever. that person attached to these memories for all time like the perception of that moment in time changes for me that i want to make mutable or be able to change that at a future point in time so how do how do we draw that line in the sand of like what is what what do we lock in and put on chain as opposed to allowing you to modify over time and that'll be just a that'll, that's a product question for us to to unlock well, as we go. Also, obviously, go ahead. Digital knowledge proof could be a solution to this because you could put the um, data on chain, which uh, is visible only to you and not to other people, and you decide what is visible in a flexible way. Uh, yeah, but well, 
I, I see the point. That's a, everything. Everything on chain sounds interesting until it's not until it's a curse. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So yeah, so, so where do we where do we draw that line in the sand? And I think it's interesting to bring in like off chain data, bring off chain data on chain as well. So like you know, time of day, time of year, weather. You know, the things the things that provide context to a memory and. That's just, it's a, it's a fluffy thing to say. And I put this in a, in a recent like LinkedIn post or mailer or something, but you know, what, when, when, when you, when someone tells a travel story, it doesn't stop at, I went to Italy, end of story. It's, I went to Italy. Here's who I was with. Here's where I stayed. Here's what we did. Here's how I felt. Uh, here's what I remember. Here's what's important. Here's what I did before. Here's what I did after. Like there's so much context that goes into creation of a memory that we ultimately want to capture and but then like, like i said where is that line of like what whether be what could be modified later what's actually practical to bring on chain and so on and so forth so it's 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 an ongoing question for us but uh that's that's where we love the feedback early on so how do you see the composability of the whole web tree travel space meaning you are basically collecting uh data which may be precious for other companies and uh, uh, how are you thinking about this in terms of like people could use our data or we can use other people that people are going to use our uh, data as a Lego, a Lego brick to create something else. Have you been playing with this idea a little bit? Just yeah, that, yes. you, just hit the, you, you, you hit the nail, you hit the nail on the head and it's, it's, yeah. it's, it's a, it's further off in the value prop, obviously, like the data is only valuable once you have it. So we need to get people in the app experiencing things, yeah. logging their travels before we can do anything with it. But thinking about like, again, one, like part of Web3 ethos, ownership of your data. And I mean that a number of ways in terms of, you know, not only, not only for security purposes and retention purposes, but also what you do with that data and how you can derive value from your data and thinking about, and this is just, so this is one of my observations coming into the space, not from a travel background. It's an ecosystem made up of walled gardens with very high walls being travel loyalty programs where I'm in, I, I, my incentive for these loyalty programs is to engage with brands over and over again, but my who I am as a traveler is not gated to what I do with when that brand in those engagements. And I would love a way to be able to tell the various brands that I most often engage with who I am in a more holistic and robust way, such that I can get more personalized, customized and curated experiences as such. And I want that to be powered by the data that I'm willing to share based upon my past experiences. So this is where Ledger is doing something quite similar, but with like image image based data by my understanding the metadata within your mobile device so yeah. ours is more an active experience as opposed to a passive experience which i think the two in, in a lot of ways work in tandem uh but for our purposes what that looks like is being able to not necessarily give the holistic part of the like the holistic nature of my data whether it be via my device or other social platforms and elsewhere but rather what i'm willing to and able to share based upon what i log via the mint pass app and then being able to say you know, check into in, in this in this forward utopian future for us, check into a Marriott property and see, you know, a QR code on the TV screen that says, you know, connect your mint pass profile to see curated concierge recommendations in in the local area. I connect my profile, that runs against a backend basically concierge AI algorithm of sorts to pair my past experience of what I like to do with what's available locally and then i can get specific recommendations as such that are powered by what i've proven to like in the past from previous travel experiences so and that and the execution of that looks drastically different across different travel verticals and there's a lot of potential there but i think the the overarching point for us is like we're not trying to be ai travel and i think right now everyone and their mother is trying to be ai travel both old incumbents and new or, or you should say old school and, and new incumbents um all that said, we went down that road and we're just like, we're never going to compete there. But AI is only as good as the, the data that powers it. So how can we create that data set and allow people to own that data set to derive value from these various AI partners uh, that are in inevitably going to be instituting this technology in their customer flows over time? All right. Um, yeah, I, I think within five years, every single hotel will, will give you an NFT for having been there. 
And if they don't, we will not go because we want NFTs. So uh, collecting uh, collecting our travel experiences on chain, creating a trail, creating a collection we can show, this is going to be, uh, in my opinion, uh, uh, something people are, are going to expect a little bit like at the beginning. The internet, you know, the connection was like, uh, we have Wi-Fi, right? Uh, and then today mm -hmm. it's like, if you don't have Wi-Fi, you're basically dead as a, as a hotel. Mm -hmm. It's going to be a bit the same. So... Uh, I, I, it's going to be I, interesting to see how this plays out exactly. And I think that's true. And the way that we want to position ourselves as we get closer to that potential reality is you mentioned like hotels getting out NFTs. Let's say Marriott launches, you know, a, a proof of stay NFT program. So every time you stay at a Marriott property, you goes in the backpack. That that that's, is it? That's, it yeah, 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 exactly. Backpack, right? that, that's oh, that's cool. Well, that's, that's the thing is like, so, 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 Yes and no. We will see. We got to partner with oh. them before that we get to, we get to that point. We'll see. But inherently, like the those NFTs would only have value within the context of your engagements with Marriott. Whereas I am someone who, while I have Marriott loyalty, I also have Hyatt loyalty. I also have Hilton loyalty, and I I stay places based upon optimizing my points and proximity to where I need to be, and so on and so forth. So I want to pull all of that information together to get the most fruitful experiences. I don't want to just get value out of this little piece of my larger travel pie being my experience of staying at Marriott hotels and Marriott hotels only. So that's where we want to be different is we capture the airlines you fly on, the places you've been, the restaurants you've eaten at, the tours you've done, the hotels you've stayed at. And obviously over time that we have to build this data set gradually, we have to work on all these partnerships with these various key operators, especially looking at like offline experiences that are more difficult to track and nail down. But all that being said, we want to create this holistic picture that, tells the full story of your travel background as opposed to just that small piece of it of that is part of the singular loyalty engagement. All right. Okay. Uh, we're running out of time. I forgot. I have to disclose that I am an advisor both at Legends and at Trient. So I think this is something I'm supposed to say. Um, and uh, yeah, you tell me now. <laughs> sorry? I said, you tell me now. No, but I yeah. like it. No, that's totally fine. And I, and that's, and this is, this is something you would agree with, like a, a rising tide, what's a, a rising tide oh, of course. carries all boats or whatever. So like I, yeah. and it's, it's odd, like, 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 like legends in particular, like they've seen such awesome success lately with like the focus, right. Conference uh, pitch win recently. So it, it's awesome to see in a, a, a project with origins and web three doing such great things on a main stage, quite literally in the world of travel. Right. And like, that's what we need. And so we hope, we hope to ride those tailwinds to our eventual success as of well. Course. And we all know this, like we talk about composability, but interoperability is a key theme here too. And we want to be able to work with yeah. partners like that to, to mutually see not only just business success, but see adoption over time. So I think mm. I, my point is like, there's, there's no, no, I, I appreciate the disclosure, but like for our purposes, like these these are the people that we want to be working with and succeeding with of in the years to come. Well, that, that's why we have launched the the travel the Web Three Travel Alliance, right? Of which you are part, yep. we are part, many others are part. This is uh, we have a sh probably short window of opportunity to cooperate more than more than fight in a way for for the same market yeah. share because the, the 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 whole market is growing. So if we if we can find find a way to coordinate our efforts. And it's much better for everybody. Um, and you mentioned the interoperability, and that's probably a, a problem in general because there's so many blockchains today that, wow, how are we going to do that? Not only us in travel, but everybody. How are we going to yeah. do that with so many blockchains, layer ones, layer twos, and, and stuff like this? Um, but yeah, you know, I know. That, that's, that's when things grow organically. They, they, they are noisy, and then later they hopefully find a, a common ground and a common language basically yeah yeah and i think i think it's we, we, i think i hope for a cross-chain future i think that's like the only way forward um i think like on the nft i think this is not like the electric travel side but like the nft trading and just like just general sort of um crypto side of things we tend to see seasons to different chains but i don't think that's sustainable where a where an asset is only as valuable as the chain that it's on and I don't think I, I don't I don't think that your chain selection should be a death death sentence if that chain doesn't come to be popular over the years, where like you know, the chain becomes like a marketing decision, but like a permanent marketing decision where if you pick the wrong marketing channel, then you're dead. 
So I think we have to find a different different option for that, which not not, not an option, but we have to find an alternative to that dynamic, which I think mm -hmm. has to be cross chain. So I think we get there eventually. Yeah, we we'll see how this this plays out. This is not something the travel industry has to solve. This is like crypto in general, and uh, yeah, we we we'll see how how that goes. Um, yeah. All right, Sen. Uh, that was that was great. Um, thank you for for all your explanations. I would like to ask you more questions and everything, but I, I'm sure we're gonna have more chances in the future. So good luck with with Midpass. And so you said you're gonna launch in in January. Did I get this correctly? Yeah, yeah January. We're planning to launch late late January 2023. Late January, okay. Um, so, but 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 for today, depending on when people listen to this, or I'm, I'm sure if it's after we launch, if you're listening to this, check us out at mintpass.com. All that being said, if if it's before then, uh, go to that site anyways, mintpass.com, because we do have a wait list. So for anyone There's that might be interested list. in trying it out when things go live, yeah, definitely sign up for that, and you'll start getting the emails, and you'll be notified once things are ready to go live. Okay, so it's mintpass.com, and where can we follow you? Twitter or LinkedIn? Uh, yeah, so I'm on, I'm Sam Simmons on LinkedIn. So if you look me up, you'll see you'll see a power stance with the with the VC vest on. So look out for that. And um, on the Twitter side, I will I will caveat with Twitter's a bit more on the DGen side of the Web three spectrum. But it should it's be. Uh, it's my <laughs> it's my it's my ENS uh, Jimmy Swag NFT ah, is my okay. handle. Okay, yeah, and you'll see my crypto perfect. punk there. Yeah, because you have particular pump, but they recently also acquired uh, Squiggle, the one behind you. Is it called Squiggle, right? Well, so, well, so, yeah. Yeah. So this is this is my Squiggle. Uh, oh. But I've actually had this for a couple of years. I just I I oh, changed. Right. I like okay. to mix up the artwork back here. So I cool. uh, I had the CryptoPunk back up here before, but I did a little switcheroo a few weeks ago. Perfect. Let's see. Let's see what's gonna be next. All right, Sam. Exactly. Thank you very much. Good luck with everything. Awesome. Thanks so much, Luke. Bye. Appreciate it. Bye bye. And we're done. Thank you for listening to this episode. For more insights, follow me on Twitter at Tripluca, T-R-I-P-L-U-C-A. If you enjoy my podcast and want to support it, head on to podcast.webtreeintravel.com, tree is a digit, and mint an NFT. If you want to sponsor it, you can do it at the same page. I will mention you in the podcast and your name will appear on all donation NFTs for a while. Thank you and ciao.